Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to a spring edition of Apex Express, bringing you an Asian and Asian American diaspora perspective from around the world. I'm your host and producer tonight, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. On tonight's show, we pay tribute to Dalit History Month, that is this month of April. We then highlight a local queer South Asian exhibition that recently opened in downtown San Francisco for a socially distanced street viewing. Stay tuned. April is the cruelest month mixing memory and desire. So wrote the famous American poet T.S. Eliot. For South Asians, April, as recently as 2013, is also another important month. It is Dalit History Month and the month when Dr. Ambedkar, who wrote India's constitution and is the most celebrated and revered Dalit scholar and leader, was born this month on April 14th. Dalits are the most discriminated community of people based on the highly oppressive and inhuman caste system that prevails to this day across India and parts of South Asia. Along the veins of Black History Month, Dalit History Month celebrates the resilience, resistance and rising leadership of Dalits in South Asia and here in the South Asian diaspora to end the oppression of caste. Listen up to this segment from the popular podcast, Cast in the USA, hosted and produced by Dalit American feminist, activist, artist and leader, Tain Marie Soundarajan. Jay Beam and Jay Savitri, everyone. I'm Tain Marie Soundarajan and welcome back to the podcast, Cast in the United States with First Post. Today's episode is a conversation with our dear colleague, Maya Kamble. Maya recently wrote an op-ed in Al Jazeera about her experiences working as a Dalit woman in tech, and it was straight fire. We are excited she's joining us today, so let's get into it. Welcome, Maya and Jay Beam. So, Maya, can you tell us what was your experience uh, being an active Dalit woman in technology in the United States? Uh, my experience as a technologist was working with Indians was very, very difficult. The main reason being, when I started my career, I was already a human rights activist. I had been to many conferences and I was helping marginalized children and my videos, some of the web pages of what work I was doing were all online when you Google me. Early on in my career, I was not working with Indians, so I did not really see a pushback. But later on, when I changed my company and when I started working with Indians, where I had an Indian manager, I really saw how discriminatory he was. Initially, the discrimination was very implicit. Uh, that meaning he would really not recognize me talking in meetings or discussions. He would not take up my points, even though they were really valid. And uh, this led my non-Indian uh, colleagues to help me out. They were also noticing. It was so uh, open that they were also noticing that uh, this manager was biased against me and they, they started helping me out in terms of what I wanted to get implemented because my suggestions were good and valid. Uh, so after six to nine months down the line, he grew increasingly frustrated and re- really his showing of uh, bias against me was not re- working that much. And one day he said, I better not touch a tool because I was ill-fated. And uh, this was like a shocker to me because he was coming up with a context of untouchability where previously uh, were treated as untouchables because you were probably not pure enough or ill-fated or uh, jinxed. So, I mean, this, I I never imagined that uh, caste would manifest like this to me in the United States. That too, after crossing all the barriers of country and after being educated in U.S., I I never could imagine that uh, caste would manifest to me in this way. 
This is so important, especially for our listeners to understand is that, you know, first of all, you know, Maya is like in a generation where she was one of the first Dalit technical um, engineers in, in the Valley and in the tech scene as a whole. So it was already an achievement for her to be here. But what's really interesting about what she's describing is that there was systemic bias in the workplace. Like because her manager knew she was an embed crite, he would continually ice her out of conversations until that breaking point where he called her ill-fated. And that's a challenge. I think when you try to translate that to an American HR department, because they'll be like, oh, what? He called you unlucky. So what? Right. But for those of us that are, you know, from this context, we know that being Dalit is being linked to inauspiciousness, bad luck. And um, and that in particular, they use those terms related to Dalit women very often. And I think that the, the gap of having to explain that and also the way he wielded that at you is a lot of context to kind of share with an HR department. And, you know, if the, the reason why your story rang so true in terms of um, our experience experiences at Equality Labs is that we've heard many cases of similar staff members um, who were not allowed to touch things because of polluting things. In fact, this one um, scientist in Massachusetts was telling me that during his studies, the, the Brahmin professor wouldn't allow him to touch the Petri dish because he felt that he would pollute the experiments because he was so unlucky. So this is not just luck without context. It has a whole history of centuries of caste bias and discrimination. And I wonder, you know, Maya, if you can share a little bit more about how that made you feel. What did your other coworkers do? And also, you know, did you report to HR? Why or why not? Me, that day was uh, so shocking to me, uh, Tenori, that I I really did not know how to react in that particular moment. My colleagues were there and they said, that's probably not a sentence in a good taste. They immediately reacted. But I I just froze at that point. But um, I thought over it over the night and I cried. Uh, I felt really bad that I went to the restroom and I cried. And uh, after that, I thought over it uh, over the night and I, I thought, I have to tell this to my HR, but I thought my HR was also American and I was on a work visa. So I did not think that my HR would completely understand what I was trying to say. And if uh, something doesn't go in my favor, then I would be uh, looking at losing my work visa and green card because of this. But I still wanted to do something. And the first thing that came up to my mind is that I should confront my manager. And uh, the the very next thing that I did when I went back to office was I took him to a room and I just uh, confronted him and I told him that I did not appreciate his comments at all. That's when he apologized and uh, he he also probably got some more feedback from my other colleagues because he said this in the presence of many colleagues and uh, he op- apologized to me profusely and, you know, started trying to correct his behavior. That was also one of the reasons why I thought to leave the matter over there and not go to HR. As you already said, right, it's very difficult for HR to understand the complete context because I thought they would think that this is a fight between just two brown people and they would not completely understand the context because caste is not a protected category in the United States. Even the majority of uh, the workers uh, in most of the big firm companies are from India. Caste is still not a protected category. So there's no sensitivity around caste. Uh, people don't even know what caste means. So uh, that that was the reason. And uh, work visa also puts in a lot of barriers on things of what you can and you cannot do. Wow. So Maya, once you were struck with how hard it was to work with managers from Indian origins, 
What were some of the other options you had? My first manager was a black manager and he was so welcoming and I was able to thrive uh, and learn so much and was able to show my work. And uh, same with any other non-Indian manager, I I really thrived in my job and uh, uh, I, I was accomplishing things. There was a sense of gratification that I had that I was doing something. With an Indian manager, it's mostly about I try to scramble myself to get something to, uh, you know, to a manager's ear. And uh, what used to happen was when people start to implicitly, uh, you know, show bias against you, it affects a person's confidence. It affects the person's spirit of working. The workplace becomes hostile. So with non-Indian managers or colleagues, it's much more welcoming uh, when we go for work and, you know, you're spending eight hours or nine hours a day at workplace. So you, you are happy when you're working there, you're happy. That's not the case with an Indian manager for, at least for me, I was always struggling to you know, get over the politics of being from the Dalit community and, you know, trying to figure out how to make my time worthwhile over there. So, and, that, uh, and, that's, and that's really an important point is that, you know, what's happening in these hostile workplaces has nothing to do with Dalit competence. It has everything to do with the way, you know, dominant caste people's bigotry and bias is actually affecting harmony and work product in the workplace. And, you know, I always love something that you said in another organizing conversation that we had where you were like, you know, it's very important to know that like when Dalits are not working, under dominant caste people, we don't just survive, we thrive. And this question of implicit bias becomes a really crucial one because I know that you've said in other contexts that what you're seeing is something that these people aren't even conscious of how bigoted they are. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, So there was another time I would like to give an example that uh, one of my colleagues, you know, she had assumed that I was uh, a Hindu and she would call me to all these pujas. And being a woman, you know, uh, they would think that I, you know, they would assume that I would go for pujas. And one day they called me two or three times and I did not go. They they were very curious why I wasn't coming because it's very unlike uh, other Indian women, right? When I very politely told them that I'm Buddhist and I don't believe in the rituals, so that's why I wasn't coming. They were really shocked, and uh, uh, she made a, she made a comment saying that, "Oh, I did not know that there were any born Buddhists in India." implying that people from only lower caste would convert themselves to Buddhism. So I was like, that's, that's where, that's when she knew what my caste was. She again started, uh, you know, making some other comments and probably she told other in Indian colleagues too. So I, I would see the difference in their behavior. They f- earlier used to eat lunch with me. They earlier used to uh, hang out with me more. Here, the, here I was facing seclusion uh, in v- because of just because of revealing who I was. And the main reason for even revealing that was because I was not going to their rituals or their traditional ceremonies. And it's not just one colleague, but when one colleague knows, all the Indian colleagues know about you. And you face seclusion from multiple people at the same time. You feel outcasted in your workplace at the same time. So the workplace environment becomes hostile. And they're not even explicitly saying it out it shows in their behavior. It implicitly shows in their behavior. They're treating you as someone from a below caste. Even though I was educated in US, I did my master's in US and probably they haven't done that. 
I was senior to them in terms of my position at workplace. They were junior to me and still they were showing an implicit bias knowingly or unknowingly. They would also talk about reservations, how it had ruined their, their lives <laughs> because uh, someone in their family couldn't get into college or university, but here we are all equal and they are still showing that bias against. And it would naturally come out to them. They will, you know, uh, it would be an effort for them to stop that conversation. Mm. So it, it was so natural for them to just say those things. It was very interesting that you said that there was a question about pujas and an invitation that you declined. And from there, even questions about your religion, because those questions essentially help your peers socially locate your caste. And this is a really painful truth because these inquiries are not about building intimacy. They're about establishing caste hierarchy. And there is no innocent motive in asking these things. And for our listeners who are not South Asian, you have to understand this is really our paper bag test for our community. The litmus test of our caste appropriateness comes out of these really invasive questions related to religion, eating practices, even our villages of origin. And it is so stressful and it's part of what makes up a hostile casteist workplace. So to that point, Maya, how did you deal with these questions and work? And what workarounds would you recommend for other caste oppressed people who are listening in our audience? I mean, the workaround that I found was, you know, either to work for yourself, that is by being an entrepreneur. The other option is to work in an environment where your colleagues are non-Indians. Because it's very stressful to change other people. And as I said, caste is in their DNA. The, the biases are uh, so internalized that it's very difficult for us to change Indian colleagues unless they want to change themselves. And it's not my responsibility to change them, right? So for, for me, I, I want to grow in my career. I want to thrive in my career. So the workaround that I found was, uh, you know, to find a place where I have non-Indian colleagues. I, I, because that way I'm not stressed about what these Indian colleagues know about me and how how they would show biases against me. So I'm not stressed about that anymore. Maya, you've been a personal inspiration to our team because we don't know many other Dalit feminist technologists. And yet you've been in it in the trenches, fighting the fight both in the workplace, but also in our community. And, you know, it means a lot because we know that there's also, you know, after the Cisco case came, you know, Equality Labs got over 250 new uh, rapid response complaints from Dalits all around the country who are complaining about um, casteism in tech. And in those those um, stories, there was a significant group of Dalit women who were saying they were also facing sexual harassment. They were disgusted by Indian bosses and the way that they treated caste oppressed people, and they were just done. And so I think with your courageous work and also your, your leadership, I'm just curious, Maya, if you can share with our audience, like, what do you think are the next steps we need to do to stop this problem right in its tracks? I really appreciate John Doe from Cisco Case who to, who had the courage to bring the issue up and to take it in the court so that he could get justice. Uh, and because of him, I have found my courage to come up and talk about my stories so openly as well. So I and now that uh, you also mentioned that Equality Labs has got more than 250 complaints. This, All of this might be just the tip of the iceberg. So I think the next steps should be to recognize, uh, you know, caste as one of the protected categories, specifically in the areas where there are so many Indians working. Because wherever there are Indians caste goes with them. Wherever they live, they make sure that they are in the groups of caste. Uh, wherever, uh, you know, they dine, they do the same. So I think the main thing would be 
to make sure wherever indians are to sensitize them about caste and wherever they are working the caste should be add, added as a protected category so that uh, we also feel that same level of protection and uh, we also can report uh, any sort of discrimination that happens to our hr uh, and uh, get justice from there and this would really enable people like us uh, who are here despite of the nepotism that goes on in getting jobs despite of all of that we have overcome and we are still thriving if we are here then it would give us a better opportunity and it would free free our minds uh, of working just uh, for non indians but it would really help us to work in any sort of environment and will help us thrive because now we are limiting ourselves to working with non indians right so uh, we want that independence if that happens i think that would be one of our biggest win because we are talking about more than 260 million people worldwide who are from untouchable caste so it's it's a very very big population that we are talking about and the problem is also that big yeah i think that you know maya again you know i'm so grateful for you to speak up because we've actually had very few ambedkarite um, women that feel comfortable speaking forward because of the concerns not just of h1b but also about their worries in terms of you know experiencing continued harassment in their workplace so your voice is actually speaking for many women who share this experience but are not able to speak um in the same way so i'm very grateful for free you sharing your thoughts with us today and also want to remind people that the if you're moved by any of the the stories that we've told on this podcast it's really important that you take that that inner change inside of your heart into action and there's lots of ways for people to get involved in terms of this battle and i think first and foremost get educated about it so come visit our website at equalitylabs.org and you can read the cast survey and you know weigh in and bring your thoughts and engage with us on social media but we also have a petition in right now to add caste as a protected category and this is really crucial because without the protected category many caste oppressed people who are dealing with workplace discrimination or discrimination in educational environments you name it um are not able to raise their cases because of the lack of cultural competency and also um just the lack of familiarity people have in understanding what caste discrimination is and so that protected category would actually open up so many things like including data collection so we know how large caste um impacts people um but also would allow us to then really be able to work towards the the ideal outcome which is intercaste interfaith workspace cases that um are homo- are harmonious and where all people can survive um but also thrive in inequity. And so, you know, Maya, thank you again and before we close, I just want to see if you had any last thoughts before we wrap our session today. Yeah, I mean, uh, also because I have kids and i have seen many parents talk about uh, hindu religion and uh, you know coming and openly speaking about a few festivals in schools so what happens there is they are implicitly teaching caste supremacy also to their kids so w- what is happening is even the next generation that which is growing up in united states are growing up thinking that either one is superior and the other other person is not so uh, just to give you an example uh, you know uh, i ha- i have a buddhist friend uh, and the teacher uh, who had a kid in the kindergarten and uh, the teacher automatically thought that she would be celebrating diwali uh, and it was a uh, it was an american teacher who asked her and she said no we don't celebrate diwali because we are buddhist and there was another 5 year old kindergartner who heard this and went and told their mom and dad and the mom and dad said oh they might be from lower caste 
and we are from upper caste and this five year old comes back and sings you are a lower caste you are a lower caste so what is happening in i am just giving this example to you guys because i i, I just want to share that other than workplace at home also kids are learning to be biased against so called lower caste people and this is happening at such a small age if we don't sensitize people about caste even in united states the same pattern of discrimination that ha- is happening in india or has happened for thousands of years now will happen will continue to happen in united states too so i i really thank you for uh, calling me in and uh, giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts and th- thanks for all the good work that you are doing i just hope that uh, whatever work we are doing uh, helps caste to be added as a protected category even in schools so that kids learn not to discriminate well and this is so important because let's be clear you know if if dominant caste people are left to their own devices they would actually turn you know all of the united states into agraharam united states you know they they will not stop unless we put a stop to it collectively as a community and i think that's really one of the most important takeaways that i really want to flag for people is that it's so natural that people start to train their children at such a young age to start to say someone is upper someone is lower imagine why does a 5 year old in the united states need to care about if someone being upper or lower right and and all that because of a difference of faith and you know i think that this is so important for people to consider is that you know a lot of these things we can't have open conversations in india and our home countries um because of the impunity of caste and because dominant caste people are in charge of many institutions including the media we are not openly able to talk about this but in the united states we don't have such restraints and in the united states we have freedom as dalit people um in part to many of the struggles black people have led on behalf of all um to have civil rights and i think that in in that honor of struggle we really have um a commitment to our own freedom and a commitment to call dominant caste people in to do better you know to do better and to be more conscious about their biases and to you know you know we have a workshop in our in our organization called unlearning caste supremacy where thousands of dominant caste people are unlearning their caste biases and it's tough work because a lot of things that they've been taught is proper indian culture is actually proper caste culture and they've not been in engagement with a caste oppressed people before so when they start to actually have meaningful authentic relationships where dalit peoples are at equity with the table it's an eye opener for them because they don't even realize wow some of the holidays i'm celebrating are celebrating bahujan death or oh wow okay that even dr ambedkar exists Dr. Ambedkar I remember growing up in the diaspora and as a young person here nobody thought Dr. Ambedkar was significant I was told by a professor that Dr. Ambedkar was not a significant Indian leader and only <laughs> after I started to interact with other dalits I was like what is this nonsense that's coming out of people's mouth you know he is the architect of the Indian constitution he laid the path for so much Uh, of the caste anti caste movements we have today and here we have some dominant caste professor saying he is not a significant indian can you imagine but yeah. i think that's actually why like dalit's feminism has been such a a very um powerful antidote to this you know brahminical hegemony because in many ways we've been able to bring an intersectional lens of power building that is inclusive not just of ourselves but of everybody and so i'm just really inspired by you both as leaders and i'm really honored by the movement that we're holding and building together because again this is not a movement that is about one single leader it's really a leaderful movement where you see so many people with lots of different skill sets taking power bringing voice and we we want dominant caste people to join us um by doing that work they need to unlearn their caste biases and they need to deeply listen and be in partnership with caste oppressed people and they need to join this movement because if they aren't they're on the wrong side of history 
And, you know, in 2020, one thing is true. Um, we are not standing back or going to be in the closet. We are going to step forward with courage and power until we annihilate caste. So with that, um, I just want to thank everybody uh, who's joined us, you know, out in the listeners. And also thank Maya again for being such a powerful voice for Ambedkarite women and Ambedkarite women in tech. And, you know, Jay Beam and Jay Savitsky, everybody. What you heard was a segment from Cast in the USA, a popular podcast hosted and produced by Tenmari Sandarajan that looks at the intersections of caste and race in the U.S. and the disturbing phenomenon of casteism prevalent in India and parts of South Asia. Exploded on YouTube last month and has now notched more than 100 million hits for its superbly produced and political lyrics that talk about caste based exploitation and poverty that has kept Dalits and other marginalized communities oppressed in post independent India. You're listening to KPFA 94.1 FM. 
and online at kpfa.org. Up next, we highlight a wonderful local community event that is happening tomorrow in San Francisco through the 18th. Popperdam Revisited is a visual and literary curation, bringing together artists who subvert and question gender and sexuality within their art. This exhibition brings together art that challenges the status quo by using and updating traditional South Asian tropes, idioms, artistic styles, and pop culture. Artists featured here are part of a larger cohort of multidisciplinary creators scheduled for the original Popperdam exhibition that was scheduled to happen last March 2020 before um, shelter in place took hold. Approved by the pandemic, Popperdam Revisited finds its home in the I Hotel Manila Town Center, cradled by the legacy of the struggle by Filipino and Chinese tenants. Listen up to a discussion I had about Pop- Popperdam Revisited. with Kamardeep Singh the curator of this bold and real time exhibition uh this is Preeti Mangla Shekhar for Apex Express i have tonight with me on air on zoom a very special guest Kamardeep Singh or Cam Singh as she is popularly known uh Cam is in is an artist is a feminist artist among many many other hats she wears and has finally a new exhibition that is opening not in virtual time but in real time So yes we finally have a real time event that we can talk about Popperdam revisited so Cam welcome to Apex Express Oh thank you thank you for having me on the show Yeah so tell us about Popperdam revisited how did it come about and what is its origin story Yeah so actually it's called revisited because we had well i had a show scheduled called popperdam in 2020 and the day of its opening party was actually the day san francisco went into shelter in place so um and that was before we recognized how extensive the impact of the pandemic was going to be so we had a lot of um pauses where we thought oh we'll delay this by a month or two months and then at some point we realized that we actually needed to cancel the show because we had no idea how long the pandemic was going to be and um we also uh didn't feel comfortable having an event indoors in a gallery space so the original gallery was pretty small and we had over 100 RSVPs for the launch party which now you know over a year out of the pandemic seems like a crazy thing to do but at the time was very normal to have a party with that many people um so this is a new version a new iteration of that show and originally i so i i ended up putting together the show because i was supported by a fellowship by the Asian American Women Artists Association AWA they have an emerging curators fellowship for new curators because they want to increase representation of asian women in curation um so being able they walk you through um conceptualizing a curation project and um all of the project management everything that comes with being able to actually put together uh an exhibition so that they they you know they were helping me the first year and then this year um actually end of last year I was able to get a grant an emergency grant to try to do the show again um with the current conditions of the pandemic and AWA continued to help me and so now we have Papadum revisited which is a smaller version of the original show the original show had 15 artists so um and I think we can share the the website uh through Yeah, the, why don't you go ahead and tell us? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can go to uh www.aawaa.net, which is awa.net slash papadum um hyphen 2020 and that will get you to the original show and you can see all the artists we had. Then if you go, you can also if you go to awa.net We also have a Papadum revisited page which is for the show that we have this year which started on March 28th. It's um we worked with how we worked with the parameters of the pandemic. So we thought about as a curator what can you do? How can you p- keep people engaged with art and keep them safe? And so we worked with the International Hotel Manila Town 
Center in San Francisco's Chinatown. And they have very large windows um, on Jackson and Kearney. So we put up some artwork in those windows. And so people can walk by and see the art and they don't have to come inside. So this time I have um, five artists total, myself included, and instead of 15, so it's less. But um, it's uh, it, it, the... I definitely encourage people to go see it. And then this Friday, um, April 9th, we're going to be projecting into the street from within the gallery space through the window. We're going to project a dance performance recording of one of the artists, Nritya Palai, of her doing a Bharatanatyam performance. And I'm really excited about that. Um, Nritya is uh, one of the few people practicing Bharatanatyam and challenging its um, challenging its caste legacy. Um, so, you know, how it's been overtaken and appropriated by elite castes in India, and she's really coming at it to question its histor history. And so, um, and she's bringing, you know, sensuality back into the art form. Right. So I'm very excited to have her as one of the featured artists. And then, um, People will also, if you if you come to that, you can see the other artists who have uh, photography and paintings and printed art in, in the windows of the, the International Manila Town Center. Right. So, so this is an, not the show. Right. So this is an outdoor exhibition. So uh, viewers who are interested in checking it out don't have to worry about safety so much as it's like walking up and down the street right in, in in manila town um yeah yeah that was part of the the goal was to keep it um safe and also to bring people into chinatown into especially with the the increase in um hate crimes against asians and mm -hmm. asian americans right. and really bring sort of a positive um presence and drawing people into chinatown for positive cultural reasons. Right. Um, one of the things you and I had talked about, Cam, was the challenges of doing this exhibition physically in, in, in the time of COVID. Can you speak to some of the challenges as you try to redo Poppadom Revisited? Yeah, it was it was really hard logistically and um, in other ways. So um, from like a logistical and technical standpoint, uh, we, you know, I was trying to work with the gallery. They weren't open during their regular hours because of COVID. So I had to make an appointment every time I wanted to go in. Um, everything, and I think a lot of people are experiencing this with the pandemic, but every everything that used to be easy to do now is very complicated. Um, you know, you have to think about transportation, the safest form of transportation, how to access a space, how to stay safe within a space. Um, if you're doing, you know, and checking how many people are going to be the gal in the gallery when I was doing the install, things like that. So logistically, there was that challenge. And then aside from that, you know, we're doing, I'm doing this show a year out of the pandemic and people are really burnt out, um, myself included. So find you know i had you know talked to different artists last year when i was putting on the original poppadom show there was a lot of excitement it was really easy to find artists people were super enthusiastic and there was just a different kind of buzz and level of energy around the show this year it was much harder because i think artists are you know we tend to be pretty sensitive to what's happening around us. And so most of the artists that were in the original show are pretty, um, the ones I approached that made sense with the space I had now um, were too at capacity or burnt out to be able to participate. So that was something I noticed. And even for myself, I was, I was a year into the pandemic trying to organize something and I wasn't fully emotionally resourced as I normally am either. So that was a big challenge. And even this whole, like, if you take a step back, like, I got this fellowship because AWA wants to increase representation of Asian women in curation. And so I was really thinking about 
the politics of representation and what kind of, you know, po power I had in putting this show together, albeit pretty limited power, like I don't have a huge budget or anything like that. And trying to think about who I wanted to bring together in the show. And I faced a lot of limits in the sense that people I wanted in the show, um, I wanted more um, openly queer artists and more trans folks who were in the show and more um, artists who were from uh, underrepresented communities. But that was pretty hard to do because the the people that I wanted in the show are also the people who are from communities that tend to be the most impacted when there's some kind of disaster. So they were at capacity, they didn't have the capacity to participate in the show. Whereas artists who come from more privileged backgrounds were ready, like they were ready. It was, you know, there's more access to them and they are more resourced to be able to jump on an opportunity. And, and at the end of the day, I'm really happy about the artists that have come through in the show and I'm, I'm really pleased. Um, but that's something I've noticed in the work that I do, even, even like um, a good example is over the summer when the protests and the uprisings were happening after George Floyd's murder, there was a lot of, um, there, you know, downtown Oakland was boarded up and a lot of artists came together to start painting the the boards and painting mm -hmm. murals on them and so me and a couple of other artist friends painted one board and um, actually two of them were in the show last year and um, we're all South Asian and so it was a really beautiful way to show up um, in that space as artists but I also we talked about it because we talked about doing more murals but then we decided to take a step back because we didn't want to be these artists that took up all the good spots in downtown Oakland um, and, and really like we wanted to leave space for black artists. But that was something I noticed was that the artists who could move quickly and claim the good spots and claim the good um, boards that had the most visibility were the ones who not everyone, but a lot of them were more resourced. They had like, they weren't emotionally exhausted. They weren't the ones who were always like organizers or out protesting or directly impacted by police brutality. So they, they were able to like quickly take spots. And it's not like I did a survey or anything. Like I'm sure we had a mix of different artists that were uh, making those murals, but it right. did make me think about how like, you know, it's you know who who is able to show up in spaces is really related to how much capacity you have and that's really related to the power you have and what privileges you have and what resources you have so that's something that came out when I was trying to organize the show too but you know at a broader level like I'm, I'm I think that it's really important that Papadam Revisited exists we have it's a it's a queer explicitly queer curation and the artists are primarily queer and femme um so that's something that i think is not those that kind of space isn't easy to find especially for queer south asian artists so i still think overall like i achieved the goal that i wanted to with the show mm -hmm. and poppadum for our non-south asian listeners is a crunchy savory snack right poppadum <laughs> yeah Papadum. yeah okay uh, so I mean, I even the name, mm -hmm. the name is, the name was picked before the pandemic. It has more like, um, you know, I had this sort of vision for this light, exciting, happy show, mm -hmm. um, which is, it still is on some extent, but you know, we all are carrying a different level of heaviness a right. year later than we were when okay. I originally organized the show. Right. And also, um, like you said, upending gender and sexuality and the, and the conventional tropes, right? So mm -hmm. really excited for your show and excited that there's something in in real time that we can go check out. Uh, tell us about some of the other artists that you're excited about. Um, you mentioned Ritya Pillai, all the way from India, whose um, video will be shown on one of the windows, right? On one of the screens? Yeah, so um, I can start with Nritya. I'm very excited. So Nritya is um, based in... Uh, in India and 
she's a Bharatanatyam dancer. And so she I would normally, I think normally would have been in the Bay Area right now had it not been for the pandemic, but hopefully will come soon. And her, what we're showing is a performance of one of her dances. And I was particularly interested in having her in the show because as um, South Asian Americans, you don't always, like when I put out a call for art last year, you know, I had cast listed in the description, but I got very few um, submissions that were related to cast. Um, but Nurtia's work has a direct connection to um, challenging the caste system. And so that I'm very excited to have her in the show. So she comes from a community that um, has a heritage or legacy of practicing Bharatanatyam. And then um, that, and I don't know the full history, but I believe like after, you know, because of the British, it was, mm -hmm. it was, um, that form was marged, that form of our dance was marginalized and then it was reclaimed after the British left, but it was reclaimed primarily by dominant castes, not the castes that originally practiced it. And I, I think my take is that um, there was like a hangover from the British because the British uh, outlawed or um, stigmatized dancing in India as, um, uh, you know, as a form of sex work and their Victorian sensibilities and like uh, disgust of sex, <laughs> mm. they like they they really like uh, paint that that they brought that attitude towards dance forms in India. So after they left and there was a you know this movement to reclaim the dance form, I, my take is that there was a hangover from the British. So they mm. the dominant caste that took took it over or tried to reclaim it took out any forms of sensuality from the dance form. So Nurtia right. is. Yeah, and then Nritya is from the original community or caste that actually practiced this, that um, and is reclaiming it and 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 practicing the dance form in a really different way than is done right now, and that's in, and, and it's bringing back the sensuality to the dance form, and also just challenging challenging how it's practiced and who has access to this form of art and this da this dance practice and that so I'm really excited to be able to highlight her her work on Friday and what we'll be doing to sort of match this like COVID safe way of exhibition is we're doing a reverse projection of her dance um, through the window so I'm testing it out tonight fingers crossed it should work um, wow. and so you can walk by and see of one of her performances projected through the window on, on a very brick screen. Oh, wow. And yeah, yeah. So that should hopefully work out. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll find out on, on Friday. And then, um, yeah, so that's one of the artists. And then we also have, um, uh, you know, there's, I won't talk too much about myself, um, but we have sure. um, two, <laughs> two artists that are recent graduates. Um, uh, Simra Farooq and Man Manaja Ganesh, which I'm really excited. I think one role I've seen myself in is really like being able to create space for younger artists mm -hmm. and, um, you know, providing them like platforms, whether it's an exhibition or supporting them through any grant money I'm able to get. Um, so Simra is a photographer and she, I'm sure if you're in the South Asian world, you've probably seen her photography Um and not maybe not realized it was her and she her her images are really gorgeous and so she has i have some of her photography up um and she's taken a lot of she takes a lot her subjects are often south primarily south asian and she looks at um building stories through her subjects so there's a few on sister she has um she has series on like sisterhood she has series on um expectations of a South Asian woman. Um, she has a series on, um, I think she has a couple series on queer couples. So she's a really um, great photographer. Like and then Menaja, yeah. Hmm. yeah, yeah. Menaja similarly is just like multidisciplinary. She writes, she um, does photography, she does printmaking, um, and she's based in San Francisco. And she's also, you know, sort of, um exploring like what it, her identity means or sorry there i misgendered them there um 
exploring what their identity means through art and writing. And so I'm really excited to give them a platform. And if you go, I'm one thing I'm really, really happy about is if you go to the show, I have their um, artist bios and like a huge picture of them on um, as part of the signage. So you walk by and you just see like these really giant um, pictures of each of the artists, um, which I, I'm hoping I can get, get a picture of them with their signs. Um, and then the last artist I wanted to highlight is Kushbu. Kushbu is a also a multidisciplinary artist, but they really are focusing on tattooing right now. And uh, they are going to be tattooing on the last day of the show, but that's uh, that's only um, that's on the by 18th? appointment. Yeah, and so really excited to be able to provide space for. It's been I think tough on a lot of artists, and especially tattoo artists because of the pandemic it's not a practice you can do very easily right now right. but with things opening up and um people getting vaccinated there is a little bit more space to do tattooing and so there we're using the last day we have the space of the gallery and and we're keeping it appointment only because of covid um and and so kushbu will be will be giving a few people tattoos and really sees tattooing as um, one of their ways of, um, you know, channeling um, their, like, their, their expressiveness and their ways of being. Um, so, and if you take a look at their tattooing designs, it's very rooted in, um, I think, South Asian patterns. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would love to get a tattoo if I can, but I think since I'm putting the show together, I won't be able to manage well, both. <laughs> you should put your name on the top yeah. of the appointment. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cam. I'm really excited to check it out on Friday the 9th. That's tomorrow um, for our listeners. And, uh, and can you give us the website once more before you go out? Yeah, please check. Let me just um, pull it up. Um, one second. Okay, please check out www.aawaa.net slash papadum hyphen revisited. So that's awa.net slash papadum hyphen revisited. And that's P-O-P-A-D-U-M, papadum, for our listeners. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. That was a discussion I had with Kamardeep Singh, one of the artists and the curator of Papadum Revisited. You can check out this exhibition tomorrow through the 18th at 868 Kearney Street past the I Hotel Manila Town Center in San Francisco's Chinatown. Google Popadam Revisited for more information. That brings us to an end to tonight's show. I've been your host and producer, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. A big shout out to Free Willing Frank for all his able tech support. Our theme music is by Asian Crisis. Tune back in next Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific for another edition of Apex Express. This is a community announcement for April 29, 2021. The Cal Performances at Home Spring Season presents Illuminations, Music in the Mind, with soprano Renee Fleming, accompanied by Robert Ainsley on piano, to offer insight into music's untapped potential for healing and transformation. Renee Fleming's recital is a combination of discussion and performance on the relationship between music and the human brain. The event takes place on Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m. For tickets or more information, call 510-642-9988 or visit calperformances.org. The Community Calendar is produced by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Please send your wheelchair accessible listings for consideration to KPFA or email calendar at kpfa.org. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767 extension 621 or view it online at kpfa.org. Wake up Friday mornings on KPFA with Rising Up with Sonali at 5 a.m. Then at 6 a.m., it's the first hour of Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. At 7 a.m., Upfront delivers a mix of local, state, and international coverage through challenging interviews, civil debates, breaking updates, and more, hosted by Janine Etter. 
Then, at 8 a.m., it's a weekly update on climate change and its effects on a local, national, and international level on A Rude Awakening, hosted by Sabrina Jacobs. At 9 a.m., it's the second hour of Democracy Now!, followed at 10 a.m. with Economic Update with radical economist Richard Wolff. Then we take a look at political and social issues in the Bay Area and beyond on El Show with Andre Soto. That's Friday mornings on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24APR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at KPFA. Good evening.